Have you, how often or have you ever had a case appealed to the appellate court? Um, I, we've had some, we've done a couple of appeals, um, but no, not a ton. I mean, I haven't had a case where they, I'm well, sure that's no. not true. I did have, I did have a case where they appealed, right? But not, not, for, I mean, there's regular, you know, every week, if you look at the Minnesota Court of Appeals, uh, mainly unpublished decisions, there's, there are family law cases, but. Um, I'm sure they're quite expensive. And right. also, yep. they have to be, yep. they have to have an outcome that they, that's really going to make a difference right. or they're really upset about Right. It. And you have to show, you have to show what the legal error was or how the judge, you know, misapplied the law. So it's a high legal standard to do that. Um, it's not, they're just unhappy with the decision. Right, right. Yeah. It's not unhappy. There has to be an error, right? And so uh, the last appeal we had was in, uh, we, it was argued in September of 18, but we don't do those, you know, because we have to talk to our client. You can appeal this. Here are what we see, you know, the chances are. What's more frequent is something called a motion for amended findings. And that is where um, you get your trial order after a trial and you go back to the judge that issued it and say, we think that there was a mistake here and here's why. And then you're back in front of that district court judge. That's not as expensive, but you, yeah, that's okay. more common. Tell me a little bit, little bit about prenuptial and postnuptial agreements. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think more pe people are more familiar with prenuptials, but right. I'd like to talk about it. But post, post are a little bit different and yeah. kind of not, I don't want to say newer, but they're becoming more common. So a prenup is right at the beginning of uh, prior to a marriage, at least 40 hours in advance, right? That you have a prenup and you lay out what's going to happen if you divorce, what's going to happen if one of the spouses dies. Um, and you include things like spousal maintenance and what, you know, you attach an exhibit that will say, here's all, you know, uh, party A's, you know, assets and the values, and then you do the same and everything is disclosed and you just, it, it just is like the lay of land. What's going to happen um, should there be a divorce or sometimes a death? A postnup is after you're already married, you execute, it looks like a prenup, right? You say how everything is going to look, but you have to be married for at least two years after you execute it. So if you, um, people will often do that if, if the marriage is getting a little bumpy and they want to say, oh, we want to, we don't want to go forward, but we want to make sure these assets go this way. Um, and they, they want to try and see if the marriage is going to work, but they're not valid if they haven't had been married for two years after they're executed. It's not always where one spouse is very wealthy and the other spouse is not. Sometimes. Well, that is, yeah. but, but that. It may be where they want to make sure that whatever they had is clear going yes. into the marriage. Yes. Or once they're in the marriage, make sure it's clear. I made a bunch of money or, yeah. or inherited right. a bunch of money, but I want to be entitled to that if something happens to us. Right. And inheritances are actually non-marital. So those are kind of out. So if someone, if you're married and you receive um, a $100,000 inheritance from grandma, right, that's, that is non-marital. How long? What if you, what if? Well, if you co-mingle it, then you get a problem, okay, right? What Meaning, if you spend it? Same, I mean, that's gone, and you, okay. you don't, you don't just get it back. When they, if you right. still have it, right? Or you receive it, right? So if you receive an inheritance and you buy a house with it, um, and then you divorce, you can show that part of that house value is non-marital because you can trace it back to the inheritance. So uh, that's something. But in prenuptial agreements, um, you want to just be sure that you're addressing that these are these are our assets and any growth on those assets, any contributions, even if it came from marital money, is non-marital. So I'll give you an example. If someone has a retirement account and it has X value, if you put it in the prenup and you say in the prenup, any contributions made during the marriage are still non-marital, then you're bound by that. Because if you don't have a prenup, and you have a retirement account, and let's say it has $10,000 in it, and then you marry, and when you divorce, it has 15, part of that is gonna be marital. So the entire retirement account isn't necessarily non-marital. Does be, that make sense? Yeah, to, to be a good family law attorney, sounds like you need to know math very well. Yeah, you do need to know math. Because <laughs> there's a lot of calculating. There even though, are. Even though you have software, right? Yeah, uh -huh. right, right. And you have to kind of get the balance sheet and, and you have to realize what, what assets have a tax consequence, right? So if you give someone an, a bank account that has a hundred grand, it's not the same as giving them a retirement account that has a hundred grand because you have yet to pay taxes on that retirement account, Isn't there right? something called a quadro or something? Yep, that's a qualified domestic relations order. And that is for retirement benefits 
benefits, um, such as a pension or a 401k, and it allows uh, the plan administrator to transfer retirement assets from one person to the other without any penalty. What about tax? Uh, if you pull it out, you, you can pull out cash, and sometimes people will pull out cash. You're taxed on the cash that you pull out. But you can transfer it. You can transfer it, no penalties. With no tax involved. Right, so let's say you have no intention of um, pulling any cash. So account has a hundred grand, they're each entitled to 50. So a, a quadro, a qualified domestic relations order, will transfer 50 into a new retirement account for the other spouse and there's no tax or penalty consequence. And that's just part of the... Uh, Divorce de decree. Okay, yeah. determination of assets and right. balancing that out. Right, okay. exactly. Right. And you put it right that there'll be a, a quadro drafted and then a quadro is a separate court order that's done afterwards that gives the authority to the plan administrator to make that transfer. I see, yeah. okay. Um, something I wanna add here, and you tell me if you see this a lot, is real estate. Right. Um, you know, spouses buy a property together, right. okay, um, while they're married or maybe before they're married. And you know, I know that has issues with who's yeah. entitled to what, but they get a mortgage and they get divorced and one spouse is you know, granted the property, let's say. Right, yep. Um, I think the assumption is that the, the spouse who transferred the property over is no longer responsible on the mortgage. That's not true, right? That's, yeah. Right, they still are responsible. Right. And I think sometimes, I mean, maybe, I, I would hope you inform them of that, but I think right. people don't realize it sometimes right. that all of a sudden, they're behind, the spouse who got the house is behind on payments. Right, and that's one of the things in drafting of agreements you have to be very clear on. So um, people mix up title and mortgages, right? right? Yep. So they think, okay, the title is in my name, so it's mine, or it's in the other spouse's name. As you said, I'm free and clear, but that second spouse is still on the, on the mortgage note. Right? right? So if spouse who's awarded the house defaults and doesn't pay the mortgage, second spouse, non-owner gets dinged, yeah. right? Because the mortgage company doesn't care what your divorce no. decree says. No. They're going to say, so we'll put language in that says that if you're awarded the house, um, you have to refinance the note within X amount of time. And to what get, if they can't? I mean, they're in violation of the de decree, right? Right. But, right. Well, we usually, if we put that language in, we want to be fairly certain that that spouse can do it. Sometimes we'll have uh, language like they'll make their best efforts. Sometimes we'll say if they can't refinance within a year, then the house has to be sold, right? Okay. So there are different um, remedies. But we put language in a decree that says this person is going to pay the mortgage and has to indemnify and hold harmless the non-owner, right? The right. party who didn't get the house. Now, the mortgage company doesn't care about that. But what would happen is if the spouse who doesn't um, uh, or who doesn't make the payments on the house, other spouse can go back to the family court file and say, "Look, you know, judge order this house sold because he's not making the mortgage payments. My credit has tanked." You know, so there's some kind of relief. But as to the mortgage company, it doesn't no. it doesn't make any difference um, to them. But in some of these situations where they say they will or they they can't or the other spouse who's getting dinged because they... Yep, not you know, paying. Yeah, um, a lot of this where you, you probably tell them you have to go to court and it's gonna cost this much and this right. much time, um, they're gonna ask you what's the likelihood that it's gonna make a difference. And I'm assuming in many cases, you don't know for sure, but right. if you know that they're not, both parties aren't working, Right. For example, and right. maybe there's no equity in the house. Right. Sometimes there's right. not because of first and second mortgage. Right. They just let it, they just have to deal with it, right? The way right. things are. Right. A lot of times I've had cases where the house has gone into foreclosure and there's really nothing um, because someone's lost a job. Um, but that's why we try and have language. In fact, it's not uncommon to put in language in a decree that says, as long as I'm still on the mortgage, even though the title has been transferred to the other spouse, I have access to all of the um, the mortgage statements and, and to make sure that those payments are being made. If spouse owner doesn't pay, I can pay the mortgage to keep my credit good, and then owner has to reimburse me. So that's something to protect people as well, saying, look, if, if you're worried that he's not gonna pay, let's, let's tighten this language up so you get a court order that you get reimbursed. You don't have to go to court. You don't have to ask the judge for that type of relief. But doesn't the husband or wife who's in the house pretty much get to be there 
Yeah, for a long free, time. Rent free. For a year, right? Oh, up to a year. Well, because it's the six months to go into foreclosure. Oh, then oh, the, oh yeah, I the, see. You're talking about in a foreclosure yeah, situation. So, yeah, okay, that's right. Okay. Right. Not, just, not if they're just behind right. necessarily. Would, right. I mean, if they're behind and try to catch up, behind, and then yeah. the other spouse pays to catch up, it, that, right. that doesn't make a lot of sense probably. Right. Well, and it's it's credit is often ruined because of divorces. I right? can imagine, yeah. Yeah, because they can't pay or they don't pay, and that's a really common concern a client will call and say my my credit score is tanked because she's not paying or he's not paying and it's 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 a little unwieldy right well, to a manage of, it a lot of them still have joint debt yes exactly. credit cards and all that and, right um you know somebody's gonna make the payments and right if, if both of them don't because they say that was your yeah things we charged or those were right the other person says it was your things right. we charged yeah and nobody wants to pay for the other person. Right, right, that's exactly right. And that is an unfortunate aspect of my work is is when you see someone's credit who has, you know, stellar credit, um, just really going from excellent to poor. So. Do you ever see a situation with real estate where they stay on the title together? Well, they have to, we have to do a new deed then. They have to be tenants in common. And if okay. they're divorced, they have to be tenants in common instead of joint, joint tenants. Because otherwise they inherit yeah. the property. Right, exactly. So, yeah. So now and again, people will. Um, not very not very often, but yeah. What about, um, what takes precedence? A will or a decree or a prenuptial or post? I mean, you talked a little bit about that. And, right. you, know, you don't have to go into all those things, but right. how, what supersedes what? And I know, it, like, if you're in joint tenancy, sure. those things supersede or beneficiary on an account, your right. supersedes the will. But how do the other things interact? Well, so if you, um, let's say that um, the way that we see kind of the will interacting with a property settlement um, or a support obligation is um, the obligor will frequently be required to have a life insurance policy so that if something happens, that spousal maintenance can, you know, you'll get a life insurance policy that is meant to cover however much spousal maintenance or however much child support. Um, but now and again, someone will be court ordered to have a life insurance policy in the decree, um, but lets it lapse or doesn't do it. So we put language in our decrees that say, in the event that the policy lapse or isn't in place, then the person, the, the recipient has a claim against the estate. Right, that that we're saying that this is an obligation that is, it's just, it it's more hoops to jump through for that person, so it's better just to keep that. Um, for a will, it they have to kind of be it, done in conjunction. Like the will needs to match. So if you have a prenuptial agreement, right, um, that says this is how it's to be in death, right? Right. I would think that that would trump the will, right, because you're saying that this is this is the binding contract. And, right. uh, but you could duke it out. You could duke it out in court over it. Okay. Right. Um, what What do you like about family law? Why Why do you like being a family law attorney? Uh, it's never, ever dull. Ever, <laughs> ever. Right? If there's yeah. always, it's so interesting. And sometimes stories or in cases things happen, you think, if I wrote a book and put this, nobody would believe it. Yeah. Right? Tell me one of those stories. Uh, let me you know, just. Think about the most outlandish one uh, you can think of. I'm trying to think of. I got a. You probably have a bunch I, I've of. I got them. a bunch. Yeah. Let me just give me a second to think about it. But and then what I, I what I like about family law is I like um, and this sounds kind of hokey, but it, there is such a sense of satisfaction when you see your client coming in at the beginning and they're in trauma and grief and you know sadness and fearful and you walk them through the process um, and at the end. You, you can see a different person. Like I think of a case, I had a woman and this was, uh, this case went to trial at least, at least 10 or 12 years ago. And she was this meek, meek little person and her husband was so, just a jerk. And, and so I'll use the vernacular. So, um, so she, she was just beside herself. And so we went, walked through the whole process. And at the end, it was like, she was a different person. She wasn't living with that demeaning person anymore. She knew that financially, um, you know, fortunately they had enough money that she would get a, a decent settlement and just to see the, the relief. So I really like helping people, um, kind of walk through that process and to know this is a trauma in your life. Um, we'll walk through it together, but you're, you're going to be okay in the end, right? Doesn't mean there's not grief and and sadness and anger and you know that right, sort of thing, but right. but it's it's really it's it's I like to see it from beginning to end, right? How the process gets taken out, plus the interesting, you know, all the stuff. <laughs> is there stuff. is there um, either you recommend or a judge will 
recommended or mandated that they have to have uh, either family counseling or marital counseling uh, to try to reconcile or right. some people just want to reconcile and try marriage counseling in right. the meantime. Right. Judges don't order, and I don't think they have the authority to order marriage counseling, but they can order parties into anger management. Um, they can order them into therapy for themselves. They can order the kids to go to therapy. They can order a chemical health assessment if there are concerns about chemical dependency. Um, so the court has authority to do those type of things. Um, they can they can order family counseling to say, you know, the, the communication dynamics are so poor, we want you to go, you know, Know, so they can do those type of things, but um, they can't order um, uh, marriage counseling. And is do sometimes people on their own decide? You know what? This is we want, we we're going to try to reconcile and let's yep. go through counseling and see yep. what we can do. And yep. sometimes that works. Yeah, sometimes it does. Okay. Yeah, and and then they might come back with a post nup, right? You know, just yeah. to see, right? Yeah. But yeah, that that's not. I think I have a couple of cases on an active status right now, meaning they're trying to figure out: Do we want to? You know, we started this process. We see what it might look like for us. Uh, we're having second thoughts here. Um, you know, so that's that's kind of you know. What about grandparents' rights, as far as you know? Right, right. So there's a statute regarding grandparents' rights, and it's just really specific. Um, you see it if grandparents. Um, you, I'll tell you what I see typically. If grandparents want to have some type of um, visitation, because it's not really parenting time, with the grandkids, most judges will say, you need to do that during your child's parenting time. So if it's dad's parents and they want to see the kid, the judge will say, okay, then when dad has his parenting time, you have to do that. Um, but sometimes in cases, um, a court will order, I had a case and um, it went to trial with, a, with a, the grandma and she had spent, the kid had lived with her, the kid was eight, and previously had lived with her for a period of time. And so that grandmother sought parenting time aside from mom and aside from dad. And the judge did grant her um, one weekend a month that she had parenting time. But it's not, um, it's often difficult for grandparents because they want to see their grandkids. And then um, if there's, a, if it's really tense between the parents, one parent might say, well, you're not seeing the grandkids. We see that on a fairly regular basis where, um, you know, to kind of punish dad, they're not gonna let grandma and grandpa see the kid. Um, what is your thoughts and opinions and on the uh, the biggest divorce of all time coming up here with Jeff Bezos and his wife with Amazon? Can you even imagine, <laughs> right? I think there'd be confidential, you know, so we oftentimes if there, are um, for financial, we'll do what's called a protective order, uh, meaning that um, nobody gets to see these documents. Um, you know, like I had a case where um, the husband had a, a ownership in, in a significant Minnesota business, right? And uh, divorce records are public information. You know, so I don't think most people yeah, realize it. Right. So or go down to your local courthouse yeah. and <laughs> look up or, your neighbor. Or they, you know? or um, I don't think are those granted very. So, well, if you often? agree to it, so like in that case, the two attorneys and the two parties stipulated to a protective order saying that all financial information, because we needed to determine what's the marital value of the business, right? Because it was an asset husband was going to receive, so wife needed to have an offset for another marital. But they didn't want their documents, and wife agreed. She didn't want everything all over. Um, so we signed a protective order, which kept that out of uh, the you know the public eye they they can't see it and those documents couldn't be released some things can be filed confidentially um, so that's another way to do that but I would bet there's going to be all kinds of you know <laughs> stipulations related to yeah. settlement and documents and you know well, all that kind of stuff you know to go on and think about this then about businesses mm -hmm. um, a lot of spouses own business together yes sometimes one spouse owns it all together, one spouse owns it with a partner right. or two, or yep, that's, they, you know, what happens in those situations? It, I mean, and I think with the Amazon situation is a big f part of the fight. If you know, is right. going to be about voting shares, right? Who has control, right? So how do you, how does that work with businesses, right? And, well, I haven't ever represented someone who owns an Amazon. So. No, no, but, <laughs> but just any right, kind but of a business. No, it's really so um, when you are a part of a divorce is assets and liabilities. I think we only got to the first part, the um, 
uh, custody and parent time, and then we talked about child support and spousal. But the third part of a divorce are, is the division of assets and liabilities. So what you do is you identify every asset. It could be a 401k, it could be a cabin, it could be a boat, it could be a business. And so what happens is um, we have easy methods for some things to figure out a value of an asset. What's, what's your most recent 401k statement? Here's the value, very easy. How much money do you have in your bank account? That's easy. A little bit more difficult is what's the value of a home? You know, unless the parties agree, then we have appraisals done and say, okay, if there's a dispute about the value of the home. Um, I think at the top of the list are businesses. So I, on a regular basis, hire their uh, business evaluator. Um, there's one in particular that I like to use in Mendota Heights. And they do a business valuation. They can be pricey, 10 to 15 grand, um, but they go in and they'll take the Regardless, uh, I mean, if it's a small, small business, you're if probably sm- not going to do no, that. No, if it's a small business. And I've, I've also hired this firm to say, look, this is the nature. If I give you last year's profit and loss, is it worth it to do a business valuation? They'll say no or, you know, that sort of thing. Because a CPA probably could give you some kind of a... Yeah. And the, the, uh, this f- firm that I hire, they're all CPAs, right? Okay, and that okay. and their work is um, valuing businesses and they do some non-marital tracing. Um, so what you're looking for in a business valuation is we need to assign a value to this asset. So how do we do that? Some, it's not worth the money. Some, it's zero. Like if the person, it's the person, it's the blue sky value, right? That, right. That that without goodwill. That, good, yep, same thing, right? So um, you, you just don't really spend a lot of time on it, or or all they have is their computer, right? You know, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but then you have you have an engineering firm, or I've had medical practices valued, or dental practices, or you know those type of things, and that's when we hire a, uh, a business valuator to do the it business value. Is a spouse? Is that just like any other asset for a spouse? That yes, for yep. both spouses, regardless yep. if they're an owner of that or not on paper? Right, right, because they have a marital interest in it. So if it was started, so if you had a business that was started during the marriage and continued through the marriage, part of it is non-marital and part of it is marital. And that business valuator figures that out. Um, If it was, if there's a partnership and it was started during the marriage, the business, it's all marital, but then what is um, spouse's what's the value of his or her share? So are they a 50% owner? The the business is worth, you know, a hundred grand, 50%, it's $50,000. And that 50,000 goes on the balance sheet. Um, and then, you know, to figure out. So it's just like any other asset, you just have to assign a value to is it. Is there issues with other partners sometimes? Um, it depends. Usually. Particularly if there's loans. Right, you know. right. Usually the loans are taken into consideration in figuring out the, the value. Um, most, Typically, the person who worked in the business is a ward of the business, right? And so sure. there's really, they just continue running the business as it was um, and, um, you know, going from there. But then they have to basically buy out the spouse's share of that. Okay. So okay. But it's not shares like, you know, we think of, but just the marital interest. Okay. That a spouse's marital half. All right. Have you have you thought yet of any crazy case you've had? Oh, there's some where you just think... Have you uh, had people who, you, the, I mean, I'm sure they have, but um, called, I mean, a lot of police involvement with domestic abuse, right. even Lots if they don't of, live together? Right. Well, we, we have cases where um, where there is domestic abuse, and that that's a little bit more um, sad, right, because there, there's violence and, and you don't want the kids to be involved. But I, I think there's more crazy behavior, like what people will do um, to kind of get the other spouse, like the you know the 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 behaviors that they'll sabotage their own financial well-being. Right. So to get, um, I have a case where um, my client flipped houses. Right. That was her job. Okay. Um, and it was time to sell the house, and the divorce had started, and husband because it was marital wouldn't sell it. Oh, right. Okay. So. Now there's all kinds of problems, you know, because that, but I know that, you know, I'll be driving away and I'll think of all <laughs> kinds because there, there are just so, so many things that you see that you just can't even believe, right. you know, or how, well, what people do. But most of the time it's because, you know, you see littler things, but when you have significant mental health issues, that's when you see the stuff that just goes off the rails. Right. You, yeah. I, I understand that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of messy situations. Yeah. Do you get um, cases that, other attorneys have worked on and they either fire them right. or maybe after the divorce is over to do post decree work i mean do you- right yep so um i see like 
I I'll pick up cases where someone else has a, a different attorney and there there might be there they weren't a good match. So either the client fires the attorney or the attorney withdraws and says I don't want to work on it. So then they have um, come to another attorney. And that happen that happens now and again. And I think that that's okay because just because you have your first attorney, you might not be a good match, right? So if right. you need to find someone that you can work well with and, and that you trust and so on. And sometimes you have a client who just needs more handholding and uh, his or her first attorney isn't that type of attorney. So they'll just want to find someone who's different. Um, um, and then oftentimes we'll have cases that it's five years after the divorce and they don't want to go back to their first attorney for whatever reason. So then we'll, we'll pick those cases up. We also will pick up from collaborative cases if there are things that happen post decree. Um, if, and they want to go to court, they can't go back to their collaborative attorney because the collaborative attorney doesn't go to court. So then we'll get hired to work on those cases right. as okay. well. Okay. So yeah, so we'll, we'll see that. Um, red flags for me are, um, you would be attorney number five, right? <laughs> or like, oh, I think I'll pass, what, you know? What, that, that leads me into the question, what kind of clients come in, or potential clients, let's say, cases you won't take based upon what they're telling you or what you perceive? Right, when people are dishonest, or they'll say, you know, like, I'll be shocked sometimes. Well, I don't want her to know about that. And I'm, I'm like... <laughs> I've got this hit overseas yeah, right, or something. Yeah, right, exactly. That I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not. I'm, you have to be forthright. You have to be honest. You have to have everything disclosed. And if someone smacks that they're not going to do that, they're going to be trouble. Like, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole, right? I'm not right. going to, you know, trade your professional reputation for someone who's trying to, you know, is got some issues. Um Domestic abusers, I mean, it, it depends because I've had clients who've been accused of domestic abuse because the other spouse was trying to get an upper hand in the custody battle. So that's different because they're kind of unjustly accused of domestic abuse. But, you know, if there are people who are, um, I think mostly just if they're dishonest. I don't, I don't want to work with people who are dishonest. Are you able to withdraw from a case if you, A, if they're not paying you, and right. B, if you feel that it's not Right. ethical for you to keep representing them? Right. So we try in our firm to really work with clients about their bill and know what the expectations are. Um, and at the pretrial, we'll sell, send a letter to a client saying, look, we're now moving towards trial phase. This is a routine letter, but are you going to make the financial commitment that trial takes? Um, because believe it or not, frequently family law attorneys get stiffed, right? They don't get paid yeah. because yeah. You're, you can't withdraw because you're going to prejudice your client. So we try and put things in place to be just a smart business owner about making sure that um, funds are secure. And then that gives them the chance to say, um, you know what, this is, I can't afford it. And, and so then we'll withdraw. Um, most people are pretty good about getting things figured out. And we do try and work with parties to, because we know it's expensive. We want to be okay. mindful of that. Um, but if we withdraw, we had a case and I, uh, it was with an associate and, and the client was just awful to her. She would call her up screaming and swearing at her. And I just said, withdraw. You, you have no obligation to continue with a client who is, you know, being very abusive. Ver yes. Yeah. Just withdraw. And she felt the associate felt bad. I don't, you know, but you, you have to, you know, if, or if clients aren't forthright, then, and I put that right in my retainer agreement. It's not this blunt, but it basically says, if you lie to me, I'm quitting, right? Because okay. I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna represent, you know, to the court something, and then the court's gonna think, am I dishonest? So that's just- Do you have to go to the court to, to withdraw? No, at, no. Your, oh, you don't? No, no, okay. it's not like in criminal cases. You can, I can withdraw anytime. Okay. I can't, I can't withdraw too close. To, to a trial. Yes, yeah. right, you can't prejudice your client, so you have to be mindful of, or a hearing. Um, but but you can withdraw. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, Joe, it's been very interesting. I've learned a lot about family law. I really appreciate you coming in today and learning about it. And hopefully, everybody gets a, a good good benefit from hearing about yeah. it and what to expect. Great. Thanks so much for having me. It was Thank very you for enjoyable. Coming.